Okay, thanks, Jeff, and welcome, everybody. I'm delighted already to meet a few people whose main model organism isn't ciliate, so so far the experiment seems to be working. We are um, drawing in people from a variety of, of other um, often more conventional models at this um, palatial hotel. So welcome to the session on ciliate genomics, genome structure, and organization. So we're going to start off with a slightly longer talk um, so that our first speaker has an opportunity to give a little bit more introduction, especially since we're welcoming a few people from outside the community. And so the first speaker is Jean-Francois Gou, and uh, he's going to talk about maintenance and loss of duplicated genes by dosage subfunctionalization in paramecium. Oh, actually, I'm reading his title, and I see that he's, this is not his talk. G-O-U-T is the first speaker. Yes, time to reboot. Aha, uh -huh, I see they are actually, yeah, they're numerically, it's, it looks like it's talk 13. But Jean-Francois, you can come up here. And I didn't get oriented, but I think we have a laser and a separate mouse and pointer. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, um, first, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present this work about the evolution of genes uh, following uh, genome duplication in paramecium. Um, so I think it's the first time that the ciliate molecular biology meeting is running at the same time and in parallel with all these other model organisms. So hopefully, we have today in the audience uh, some people who do not come from the ciliate community and Maybe if you're one of these person, Paramecium might be some old obscure memory from uh, high school. So um, how do I? Oh. I can't switch to the next Should slide. Should the slide advanced? And the keyboard doesn't seem to work either. There. Okay. Okay. Right. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. So yeah. So just a few um, things to know about paramecium, if you're not familiar with this wonderful organism. So paramecium are unicellular eukaryotes. They live in fresh water. You can find them in ponds and lakes all across the world. Um, it's hard to see in this picture, but there are cilia uh, all over the uh, outside of the cell. And the cilia, they can vibrate in a coordinated way, which allows the cell to swim and to catch uh, bacteria, which is its source of food. And um, these organisms, they can alternate between vegetative and sexual growth. Okay, so here's where uh, paramecium and ciliates are on the tree of eukaryotes. And here's where us humans are. So they're pretty much as far as it gets from us. And um, here are the other model organisms that are present at the conference on the tree of eukaryotes. So we have nematodes here, drosophila, mice, <laughs> zebrafish, and yeast is a little bit further away. So I think it's fair to say that we are the outliers. <laughs> um, I think it's actually a great opportunity because that will allow us to by studying the genomes of these organisms that are clearly understudied, uh, we can discover what uh, evolutionary processes are universal, are shared across all eukaryotes, and which ones are very specific to uh, certain branches of a tree of eukaryotes. And you will see that ciliates are capable of amazing things. And if, you want, if you're not familiar with ciliates and you want to uh, see something absolutely amazing, I strongly recommend everything about um, the uh, genome organization and program DNA elimination. It's something that you find nowhere else in eukaryotes at this scale. Um, so the first paramecium genome was sequenced and published in 2006. And the big surprise that came from this genome was the total number of genes, 40,000 protein coding genes, which is roughly twice as many as what we have in the human genome. And the reason for uh, this abundance of protein coding genes is the presence of many, many duplicative genes. So here on this figure, 
uh, you can see the genes alongside chromosome one and chromosome eight, and these red and blue lines uh, link together genes that are paralogs. So they are copies of each other that can be identified through sequence similarity. And you can see that um, like pretty much every gene, I mean, most genes on chromosome one, they have a paralog on chromosome eight. And the way we interpret this observation is that chromosome one and eight in paramecium derive from a single ancestral chromosome that was duplicated at some point in the history. Now you can do the same thing with all chromosomes in the genome. And you will see that you can pair these chromosomes by two, two by two, like all the chromosomes in the genome fall in pairs of two, which tells us that the entire genome was duplicated at some point. Okay, now here's where it gets really funny. We can reconstruct the ancestral genome by merging these pairs of chromosomes and apply the same analysis. And we find evidence for an other, more ancient whole genome duplication. And then we do it again, and we arrive at the situation where we have evidence for at least three successive whole genome duplications in the lineage leading to paramecium. So it's pretty amazing, but whole genome duplications are not that uncommon. We find evidence for um, ancient whole genome duplications in many, many different eukaryotic lineages. The most solid ones are probably the ones in yeast. There are also some ancient genome duplications at the basis of vertebrates. Uh, a third one specifically for tailored fish. If you work on plant genomes, virtually every flowering, flowering plant is um, polyploid, and uh, has like some history of sometimes multiple genome duplications. And also the Xenopus has um, some fairly recent genome duplication. So one of the reasons we are really interested in studying gene and genome duplication is because we think these processes are involved in the evolution of new functions. And this has to do with how new functions evolve. So the current thinking is that most new functions, they evolve by modification of an ancestral function. So it's much easier to take a gene that makes something and then modify this gene so that it does something else rather than invent a new function de novo from scratch from just a random uh, sequence of DNA. Now, one problem with that is uh, we think that oftentimes new functions, they are acquired at the expense of the ancestral function. It's difficult to evolve a new function in a gene and still keep the ancestral function. But you can solve this problem with duplication. If a gene gets duplicated, then one copy can maintain the ancestral function and the other copy is free to explore some new landscape and maybe evolve a new function. And of course, when you have a duplication of the entire genome, that represents thousands and thousands of opportunities to evolve new functions. So um, there are clear examples uh, of uh, this phenomenon. For example, in yeast, uh, it's been pretty uh, clearly shown that um, one of the reasons that yeast is so good at fermentation is thanks to the whole gene duplication, because a whole set of duplicates become specialized into the fermentation processes. So next time you enjoy your beer, remember it was made possible by whole gene duplications. However, not every gene has such a glorious fate as becoming the gene that allows yeast to make fermentation. Most genes after duplication become pseudogenes and are eventually lost from the genome simply because the two copies are redundant. So for paramecium, we probably had a history for the number of genes where the ancestor had something around 20,000 protein coding genes. Then the genome duplication doubles this number. And then we have a phase of massive gene loss. So we get back to roughly the same number of genes we had before the duplication. And then another duplication, gene loss, duplication again, gene loss, and that's where we are right now in Paramecium tetraelia. So we're still in the middle of this phase of uh, massive gene loss. Um, something really nice for evolutionary study with Paramecium 
um, is that uh, Paramecium tetraria is the member of a group of 15 species called the Paramecium aurelia complex. Um, all these guys here, these 15, oh, not all 15 are on the, on the tree, but there are 15 species known. They all look exactly the same. If you look at them under the microscope, you cannot tell the difference. And actually, when Tracy Sonborn started working on it, he thought there was only one species, the Paramecium aurelia species. And it's only after the discovery of mating types that uh, people understood, that Tracy Sonborn understood that these were multiple species. So clearly, despite uh, all these opportunities for evolving new functions, it did not result in evolving a lot of diversity in uh, the morphologies and in the shape of these cells. So something that we did is we sequenced the genomes of some other members of the Aurelia complex, as well as uh, outgroups, so Codatum and Paramecium multi-micronucleatum, which are two species that diverge before uh, the last two genome duplications. So what we saw is that um, the fraction of genes that have been retained since the whole genome duplication varies quite significantly between the species. So Sex Aurelia has written only 41%, so it seems to be losing its copies, its duplicated genes faster than, for example, by Aurelia, which has still 52% of its gene, uh, of its duplicates retained. So this tells us that the evolutionary forces that are acting to, on one side, uh, erase genes from the genome, and on the other side to preserve the two copies, they are probably slightly different, and some of them are stronger in some species than in others. And that's the question I'm really interested in, is to understand what are the evolutionary forces that are responsible for preserving uh, duplicated genes. So why some uh, duplicated genes are retained for millions of years, while others have been lost immediately after the gene duplication in paramecium. And maybe we can also learn uh, from paramecium about genome duplication in other species. So um, to illustrate the different models on uh, how duplicated genes can be retained, I'm going to use my favorite model gene, the Swiss Army Knife gene that contains two functions. Uh, one is the scissors function and the other the knife function. So if there's a duplication that creates two copies of this gene, as I said, what's going to happen most of the time is one of the two copies will pick a mutation that turns it into a pseudogene, and this copy will just be eliminated from the genome. And you're fine because if you need the scissors or the knife, you still have this copy that's present in your genome. Now maybe one of the two copies will be extremely lucky and pick a mutation that allows it to evolve a new function, in that case the USB flash drive function. And if this new function is beneficial, if it increases the fitness of the organism, then selection will operate to preserve both copies. But what's more likely to happen is a reciprocal loss of uh, the two ancestral function. So for example, maybe this copy will lose the knife function first, then the second copy will lose the scissors function, and now you're stuck in this uh, situation where you have to maintain both copies if you want to have the two functions present in your genome. Okay, so how do we know what the function of a gene is? How do we translate these scissors and knife things into real biological functions? Um, so trying to understand what the genes really do. So some of them, you know, we can identify the, like a transcription factor or maybe a protein kinase or whatever you want to think. Um, it's very difficult to know what uh, the function of a gene is. We're not capable yet to just look at the sequence and say, oh, this gene does this and this and that. So people use proxies to try to infer the function. And a very useful proxy is the expression of genes. In multicellular organisms, you can look at expression in different tissues. And if you find a gene that is expressed specifically, for example, in heart and in liver, you will say, okay, this gene has a function in heart and in liver, and maybe you will find sub-functionalization with uh, two copies that are retained in each of the two different tissues. Another problem is we can't redo really that in paramecium. 
So remember the single uh, unicellular eukaryotes. Uh, so we don't have different tissues. But yet, they're very uh, complex organisms with plenty of cellular compartments. So we can try to localize um, the product, the protein products of the genes to try to understand their function. And if you want to know more about that, I encourage you to go see the talk by Lydia Bright, which uh, will be on Friday afternoon, I think. Um, but we don't need to invoke change of function to explain retention of duplicated genes. Genes can be retained after duplication simply through dosage balance or dosage constraints. So the dosage constraint is simply the idea that the two copies, the two genes, produce the same protein that performs the same function. You just need two copies to produce enough of this protein. And if you lose one of the two copies, you're not going to make enough of the final product. So um, with Laurent Duré and Daniel Kahn, we developed a model to try to explain how uh, these dosage constraints can explain the retention of genes in the paramecium genome. And um, one of the predictions of this model was that highly expressed genes should be more retained, that the selective pressures against pseudogenization of duplicated genes should be stronger for pairs of genes that have high expression level compared to genes that have low expression level on average. Okay, can we see that in the data? Uh, spoiler alert, the answer is yes. But uh, here's how we do that. So we're going to take advantage of the fact that we have a sequence of an outgroup, paramecium codatum, which diverged before this last two genome duplication. And uh, we're going to look at the orthologs in one of the paramecium Aurelia species. Um, that could be any species. The data I'm going to show you is from Tetraurelia. And the question is, so when you have these two red genes, that means that they've been retained since the duplication. The gray ones are the copies where one, the genes for which one of the two copies has been lost. And do we really see a pattern where these, these guys have high expression level, while these guys in gray have low expression level? So to test this, we uh, obtain expression data from Codatum with uh, RNA-seq. It's just pretty standard method. We group the genes in the paramecium codatum genome in bins of expression level. So here I have eight bins from low to high expression. Um, the histogram just shows the distribution of expression levels uh, for the 18,000 genes in codatum. And then for each bin, we compute the average retention rate of the orthologs in paramecium tetraurelia. So for example, this point tells you that the genes in tetra, in, sorry, in codatum that have low expression level that are in this bin, their orthologs in tetraurelia have been retained after the most recent gene duplication only about 40% of the time. But the ones from the high express bin have been retained more than 80% of the time. So clearly, um, the expression level is a strong uh, factor that determines the probability that a gene, a pair of genes will be retained following whole genome duplication. And then we can do the same for uh, other species from the Paramecium Aurelia complex. So here we have the same thing for Paramecium Bi Aurelia and for Paramecium Sex Aurelia, and we see the exact same trend. So this seems to be a, a fairly general trend. And actually, we looked at yeast. So in yeast, the genome duplication is much more ancient. Uh, but we have roughly like 10% of the pairs of genes that have been retained. And we see kind of the same pattern. It's much less clear because there are fewer genes to work with, but the pattern is still there. And it's something that I think had been a little bit overlooked in the yeast duplication, and that we learned from looking at the paramecium thanks to uh, the large number of genes that are in paramecium. The fact that the gene duplication is much more recent, uh, so the signal was much more clear. So I think it's a pretty nice example of Paramecium showing, explaining to us um, some universal uh, evolutionary forces that act after genome duplications. Okay, the next question I'm interested in is what happens when the expression level diverges between the paralogs? So um, remember, the whole genome was duplicated at some point in the lineage of Paramecium. 
So these duplicates, they were born with the same regulatory regions, the whole, like the transition fighters, everything is duplicated at the same time. So it's very likely that they were born with the same um, expression level. So in this graph, what I plot is uh, the expression level for each pair of paralog in the paramecium tetralia genome. So the expression level of paralog one versus paralog two. So if the two copies have the same exact expression level, the points will be on the diagonal here, this red line. And you can see that that's still a pretty good correlation. Most of them fall not too far from the diagonal, but some of them start to diverge uh, quite a lot. So how does that impact the retention of genes when the expression level between the two copies starts to diverge? Um, so I have a cartoon to try to illustrate this. Uh, as I said, the two copies we suspect were born with the exact same expression level, which is uh, represented here with these red uh, bars. And then after some time, accumulation of mutations in the cis regulatory regions, we can have divergence of expression. Maybe one copy will be expressed at a higher level than the other one. And again, we're going to use comparative genomics to uh, understand how this divergence in expression level can affect the retention of the gene. So what we're doing is we're looking at genes, pairs of genes in a given species that have divergent expression level, and we're asking whether the retention rate in the sister species, in this case Bariraria, is the same as for all the genes or not. So let's first look at uh, what happens when um, the expression level is conserved. So we just look at um, pairs of genes that have been maintained in Borrelia, and we ask the question if the two copies have been maintained in Borrelia, what's the probability that one of the two copies have, has been lost in Tetraorelia? So we look at um, pairs of orthologs. And this probability is just 10%, 0.1. Um, and now we look at the same thing, but specifically for the pairs of genes in Borrelia, where the two copies have diverged in expression level. So you have one copy that's very high expression level, the other that has a low expression level. What are the, what's the probability that they're orthologue? One of the two copies has been lost in uh, Tetralia. And we have a 2.4 fold increase in the probability of gene loss if um, the orthologues have diverged expression level. So clearly that tells us that, uh, I mean the way we interpret this is that the divergence in expression level is the first step towards gene loss. And what we observe is that in 81% of the time, the copy that was lost is the one that had the lowest expression level. So what we think is going on is these genes were retained for constraints on the dosage, and just we had two copies because we wanted to uh, express a lot of the protein, but then once we reach this imbalance in the, in the expression level from between the two copies, losing this copy, the low express one, doesn't change much the total product of protein that is produced, and selection will not oppose the loss of this copy. So okay, how do we go from uh, this situation where the two genes have the same expression level to the situation where we have a strong imbalance in the expression level between the two genes? So what we think happens is that um, the paralogs can go on what we call a, a, a random walk along this line of conserved total expression. So it's this blue line here that represents the conserved total expression, which means um, if you start here and then you go there, uh, one of the copies has seen its expression level decrease, but the other one has seen its expression level increase by the same amount so that the total expression level, the sum from the two copies is the same. And you can reach this point by just small increments. Maybe the first mutation will slightly decrease the expression level of uh, copy number two. So you go from here to there. And then the next mutation will slightly increase the expression level of copy number one. And you keep doing this random walk without going too far away from the blue line. And you end up in a situation where most of the expression comes from just one copy. So you have this imbalance in expression level and then one of the two copies, the one with the low expression level, 
is mostly relaxed of any um, selection. Okay, so just to summarize um, the model, we think what happens is that after duplication, the two copies are born with the same expression level, they are retained for dosage constraints, but then progressively uh, the expression level starts to diverge between the two copies, which leads to this strong imbalance, which, can, which then releases the selective pressure on the copy with the lowest expression level. And if you wait long enough, you will, uh, the lowest expressed copy will be lost in all the species. Okay, so these are just uh, the take-home messages. Uh, the Parmesan genus has experienced multiple whole gene duplications. Not the only uh, eukaryote to have seen that, but uh, a pretty interesting one to study. Uh, we've seen that expression level is a strong predictor of the evolutionary fate, so whether the gene will be retained or lost after the duplication. And we think that this thing that we call quantitative sub of gene expression is probably a very significant mechanism for uh, duplicate gene preservation. With this, I would like to thank all the people that made this work possible, especially Casey McGrath and Tom Doak. Uh, Casey did all of the preliminary analysis of Baralia and Sexualia. Tom has been uh, very important into making the Promethean project work in uh, the lab. And I'm running out of time, so very quickly, uh, I want to advertise we have a postdoc position uh, opening in the lab. So if you're interested in um, doing molecular biology on uh, ex understanding how gene expression is regulated. Uh, please come talk to us. Many of us from the Lynch Lab are here. Uh, the Lynch Lab is a very active uh, member of the community, and it's located in Bloomington, Indiana, which is a very nice place to live with great outdoors. Um, thank you for your attention. Um, so there are cases where you can still uh, find the, uh, the pseudogene there. There are cases where uh, yeah, there's still uh, some sequence of fragments of open reading frame that are present in the genome, but most of the time we don't, uh, like it goes very fast once the gene is inactivated. These species are still diver they diverged a couple of million years ago. So there's been plenty of time for mutations to accumulate and to uh, erase uh, the pseudogene. So in some cases, the very recent losses, yes, we still see, uh, we, sorry, I don't know if you can hear, we still see um, evidence in the sequence for the pseudogene, but in many cases, it's too old and there's no more trace in the sequence. Thank you.